a bottleneck funnels these exiting bats into dense concentrations, attracting the attention of others. snakes using echolocation, but the snakes are literally in the dark. They can see nothing. The strikes seem to be largely hit and miss, but the snakes have a secret weapon. They can actually sense each bat flying past. Receptors in the snake's head pick up the heat given off by the flying bats, as this thermal image shows. To the snakes, the bats are apparently glowing, and this gives them something to aim at. This is the price that these cave commuters must pay for their daytime sanctuary underground. Small wonder then that there are other cave dwellers that stay put. A male red-sided garter snake. He survived the winter by hibernating underground where the temperature never dropped below zero. The weak sun persuades more males to emerge. They're cold and can't move fast, yet they are in an urgent race. The first males to warm up will have a head start when the first females appear. Meltwater provides the first drink they've had for six months. At last, a female has emerged. The warmest males will inevitably be the first to react to her smell. She will only mate once, so competition between them is intense. This male has overslept. He will need hours to warm up. At the moment, he stands no chance of mating. Most of the other males are ready to chase females, but curiously, some leave the race and go to join the cold male. They slide their warm bodies over him, just as they would if they were courting a female. More and more males crowd round him. Why? Their relative temperatures show what's going on.
His cool body showing as blue is quickly warming as it absorbs heat from the other males. He's a trickster. He's fooled the others by giving off a scent just like a female's, and they are trying to mate with him. He only needs a few minutes of this to steal enough heat from his rivals to catch up and join the chase. Every spring, tens of thousands of garter snakes fight it out in this mating frenzy. It is, in numbers, the greatest gathering of reptiles in the world. Our fear of snakes is really a fear of vipers. Yet it's mixed with fascination, too. If there's one viper everyone's heard of, it's this one, the rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes belong to a group called pit vipers, found all over the New World. Like all vipers, they're ambush predators. There's a lot we don't know about snakes. That's one of the things that makes them dangerous. Rattlesnakes hunt at night, so if you want to hunt them, that's the best time to do it. A junkyard is viper heavy, with plenty of hiding places to launch an ambush. Somewhere in the darkness, the world's most prolific killer is waiting. It's armed to the eyeballs with a lethal injection of venom. Shelton Herbert and Curtis Railing are snake bite scientists. They're armed with just a rubber glove on a stick, but there is method in their madness. Tonight, they've left the safety of the lab to collect a sample of fresh venom in the wild. They want to measure the poison in a rattler's strike. But first, they've got to get the snake to bite the glove. Vipers are predators, but it's self-defense that makes them deadly to humans. It's not our fear of vipers that's a problem, it's their fear of us. Suddenly in the spotlight, baffled by this bizarre intruder, the snake turns on its first line of defense. It doesn't want to resort to violence. It can store about a teaspoon of venom at a time, but once used up, that takes days to refill. So, here's the dilemma. To bite or not to bite? There is a compromise. The rattler can bluff it, use its fangs, but not its venom. It's called a dry bite. But if you still don't take the hint, you're asking for the real thing. Frozen in time, we see what makes the viper's bite unique. Erect fangs, right up front. They're only in the victim for a fraction of a second, but that's long enough. If this was your hand, it would need a shot of anti-venom. Fast. Red-eyed tree frogs that keep a lower profile generally mate successfully. They are careful breeders, their spawn is not laid in the cut-and-thrust environment of the forest pond. The female extrudes her eggs onto the underside of a leaf, each protected within its own miniature pool. But new life is rarely out of harm's way.
cat-eyed snakes slink around the seasonal pools, tasting the night air for the hint of newly laid frog spawn. Cat-eyed snakes are partial to frogs' eggs, but they can rarely stomach the whole jellied mass. Down in the pond, there are lots of hungry mouths that would make even more of a meal. Overall, red-eyed frogs have a better chance of developing on the leaf. They drip into the pond as more advanced tadpoles, better able to defend themselves. They run the gauntlet of two worlds. They feed underwater, but also need to break the taut surface for air. Fishing spiders thrive on surface tension. The water's skin becomes an extension of their own. Their legs are like primed triggers as they wait for a contact. If you've seen Deadly 60 before, then you'll know that rock climbing and snakes are two of my favourite things in the world. So going rock climbing looking for snakes is kind of my idea of heaven. But there is a very real reason for this. You look along the waterline here, you'll see the rock face is pockmarked with tiny holes and that's where I think we're going to find our snake. Unfortunately, Johnny, my cameraman, is uh, he's pretty tough but even he can't swim over there carrying that huge camera and climb up the rock face filming using it. So everything I see, I'm gonna to have to film myself in a Deadly 60 style. Time to get wet. Hello, Stevie. <laughs> the boat can't get any closer to the rocks. So to get there, I'm gonna to have to swim without getting the bag with the camera in wet, of course. There's an entrance to a cave here. I'm gonna have a squeeze through and see what I can find. The snake comes out onto the rocks after hunting in the sea to chill out and digest its dinner. So it's a good chance for me to get a closer look. Kinda of weird this, crawling into a deep cave, looking for deadly venomous snakes. Oh, look at that. I've got it. I've got my first yellow lip crate. It's the exact kind of snake that we came here to this island to find. This has got to be one of the strangest snake catches I've ever done. Hanging off the edge of a rock with a camera in one hand and a venomous snake in the other. So I've got to keep my wits about me and concentrate. If you're wondering how it got the name yellow lip sea crate, have a look at the front of its head. This bright yellow marking across the front of its snout gives it its name. The snake is just resting on the rocks, but I want to see them in action. But I'm not going looking up there, I'm going down there. 
So I've got to get kitted up for diving and search for one of these venomous snakes in their watery environment. One, two, three. 